Hello and welcome to the This Works For Me virtual summit. I'm your host, Firm Faith Watson. I am the director of the Faculty Development Center at Murray State University. Are you looking for strategies to help your learners be successful, regardless of their skill sets or abilities? Well, our guest today, Dr. Peter Van Luizen, will be providing you with some strategies to do so. Dr. Luizen, thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you. It's great right to be there. Thank you. Right. So I'm really glad to have you here. I know you have a whole lot of experience and today we are privileged to just hear a little bit of some of the things that you will share. So tell us a little bit about yourself, who you are, where you're from and what you do. Yeah, my name is uh, Peter Van Lusen. Uh, I grew up in Germany, but came over to the United States uh, quite some time ago. Uh, I'm, I'm currently a manager of instructional design at Arizona State University. I'm working in a group there called Ed Plus, um, and I'm particularly in a subunit where we try out, explore, test out new models of digital education. And in particular, I'm working on our adaptive initiatives uh, here at uh, Arizona State which actually last academic year, we had close to 27,000 students go through an adaptive experience. So, wow. Yeah, it's quite exciting. I know. And the title of your strategy is Designing Adaptive and Active Learning Experiences. Yep. So could you help us understand what are adaptive learning experiences and active learning experiences? Yeah, certainly. Uh, do you mind if I share some slides? Is that okay? No, not at all. Go okay. ahead. I yeah, I found that, that it's... Yeah, it's a found it's a fairly uh, complex topic, so it's sometimes good to to talk about it and use some visuals to explain that. Uh, first of all, I want to make sure that everybody gets credit who gets credit deserves. So I'm working closely with Dale Johnson, who's really the the mastermind behind this idea and the adaptive active uh, solution that we have here at Arizona State. So I want to make sure that he gets plenty of credit for this. But pretty much, as you mentioned, what's the goal of the adaptive uh, experience? It's really for us, it's to provide the right lesson to the right student at the right time. And that's quite important because if you really think about it traditionally, the way we have done it in the, in the factory model and the math of production model is that everybody gets through the same uh, learning experience in the same classroom. and then we get the same uh, assessment at the end. And of course, as more and more diverse students come into the classroom, um, we find that this might not be the best way to do so. And that's actually what uh, directly aligns with our mission here at ASU, where we are focused on accessibility and um, student success. So wow. uh, do you want to learn a little bit more about the background or why we Yes, yes, I want to know. That? You know, okay. what got you into this? What impressed you to start using these strategies and how has it worked for you? Yeah, I, uh, so ASU actually has been working since 2011 with various adaptive vendors. Uh, you can see some of the names here. Some of these products don't exist anymore. Mm. And on the right hand side, you can see all these different courses that we have created in adaptive environment. Personally, I joined the Adaptive Initiative in 2015, so mm -hmm. and, uh, a couple of years ago, and I worked uh, mostly with our uh, history course, uh, our f uh, uh, economics courses, as well as our biology courses. Mm -hmm. um, uh, which are quite exciting to work on and so on. And yeah, uh, so ASU has been quite involved with this adaptive initiative for a long time because as I mentioned, what really guides our efforts here and uh, this mm -hmm. initiative is our charter. And for everybody, is, for the people who are not familiar with ASU, we are a school that really focuses on who we, and we're not, we measure by us, here the key sentence I highlight is we don't, we measure ourselves not by whom we exclude, by, by whom we include and how this to succeed. So there are two things here, which is inclusion, access, and to success. Mm -hmm. So why the adaptive initiative? How does it relate to it? Well, it's uh, quite simple. So if we're a school that is accessible, um, that means we open up the doors to different types of people with different types of background, different age, different knowledge, different experiences, and mm -hmm. so on. And then uh, what we saw then that uh, these people all went to the same courses, classes, like particularly in the freshman experience, the general education courses, such as introduction to biology, college algebra, and so on. Mm -hmm. So what happens if you have a lot of people come into these classes? They become large enrollment classes, uh, which are like 300, 400, 500 students. And so you have them in a large lecture hall, and they tend to be then taught in a lecture style, 
and not everybody is prepared to be successful in that environment. And so we saw actually quite some issues with student performance, like mm -hmm. which is grades, ABCs, and student mm -hmm. retention. So pretty much a lot of people were dropping out of the courses because they, they were not able to prepare, they were not prepared to engage with the lecture. Mm -hmm. And so the adaptive initiative is a specific intervention that was designed to keep people in the seats and make them successful. Mm -hmm. uh, this is people like the results. Uh, so this is something that we have seen here. I'm just going to briefly touch over this. So what we have here is the introduction to biology course in, mm -hmm. uh, we have two semesters together. So which makes it 850 non-major students, freshman students same instructors, same curriculum, similar assessments. You can see before we had uh, lecture, uh, before we had the adaptive initiative, we had lecture style classes, retention rate was like in the 70s and then maybe 80s. Uh, I mean, sorry, um, success rate was in the 70s and in the 80s and then retention rate was not that great. Mm -hmm. uh, we tried just the active model, which is student-centered teaching. Uh, and what we've seen is when somebody does this for the very first time, uh, the instructor is learning as well. So there tend to be some mm -hmm. uh, challenges. But here's something, once we uh, implemented the adaptive active initiative, you can see that our retention numbers significantly um, increased. So withdrawal decreased and our success increased as well. That's in biology. We saw something very similar in our math course uh, where we have, at that time, this is two and a half thousand enrollment. This semester, we already have seven and a half thousand enrollment. In this. So we see an inc amazing increase in retention and success. So, and um, yeah, so I think one of the questions you had for me. Yeah, because I would, could you just, kind of walk us through the process, the model that you have for ad adaptive learning. Yeah, that's good. So, um, and I use this slide to explain it a little bit. So as I mentioned we previously, we had like a, a lecture style model. So very commonly used. So what we did, we did a flipped class scenario and where students pretty much work here uh, with the adaptive system individually because before they come physically to class. Mm -hmm. So think about it, it's like an e-text on steroids. You have videos, you have images, you have um, readings and so on. And then you have little uh, formative assessments, right? Like uh, mini quizzes, some interactives and so on, where student can, students can test their understanding, can check their understanding and so on. Mm -hmm. So and that's really adaptive because it adapts to the student's behavior, to the student's choices and so on. And and since your choice is a uh, firm face, for example, might be different than my choice, you will see different pathways and different um, uh, ways to get to the same outcome. Mm -hmm. So then if you went through your experience and I went through my experience, we come both to class and we're at the similar level. So then we can, uh, then we focus, uh, then we change the instructional model from lecture based to student center teaching to active learning as they call it where we do more collaboration discussions case studies project-based learning and we really focus on the application of these concepts uh, and facts that we learned in the e-text mm -hmm. and also we do our summative assessments in the uh, as, as part of the in-class experience online experience so 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 could you help me understand some of the technologies that people use to do these I yeah, I, as I mentioned earlier, so we use different, we ACU partner with different uh, vendors. Uh, mm -hmm. So for math, we use uh, Alex, which is developed by McGraw Hill. Uh, for biology and uh, history, we are partner with a smaller company called Cogbooks, which are out of Europe, but they also have a big footprint in the US. Uh, we've partnered with Sengage Learning and so on. So uh, if you, you know, when people want to go back to the slide in the beginning, you can see all the different vendors we do. And what's unique, though, is that we really partnered with these vendors. That means uh, we don't just buy these things out of the box. Uh, we actually are able to customize them. We're able to work with the vendors to develop these products in order to fit the needs of uh, our diverse students and so on. So that's very unique. Uh, I've worked on a different at a un different university before where we didn't have that partnership model. So I found that to be helpful for scaling as well as uh, uh, 
yeah, for scaling the, these types of uh, initiatives. So. Great. So what has been students experience like in these? Um... Yeah, that's uh, an excellent uh, ex um, uh, question. And so really, if you think about it, so as I mentioned, individually students go through these uh, the learning in adaptive learning experiences on their own right and so what's really adapting to them are two things uh, lesson sequence and the content mm -hmm. so what i mean with that is lesson sequence is like for example i might go through a lesson with like module a b c d while you depending on your choices and responses and so might go through in a different like uh, b a d c right mm -hmm. so it's really adjusting to uh the way that the, the system is programmed as well as your choices and your knowledge and understanding, right? And also there's content selection. Uh, at times, uh, not just a sequence, but sometimes there's choices. Uh, you might be, for example, be interested in a video. So you could watch a video while I might be interested in, in doing some readings. So I will be reading. So you could have the choice to get the content through a video while well, I get it through a re reading and so on. So this is really adapting uh, to uh, the learner. And what's key here is like really what is the lower part of the slide is like how these decisions are made. And that's really because a lot of people say today, hey, this is adaptive, this is adaptive. A lot of vendors tell you that. But there's really what we uh, find out that four different types of adaptivity. Uh, the most basic one, that pretty much most LMSs have today is assessment based. Mm. Think about it, everybody in the class goes through the same material, mm -hmm. right? Like you read the same article, I read the same article. And at the end, there's a little assessment, could be an interactive, could be a question, multiple choice question. Mm -hmm. Firm face, since you're smart, let's assume you uh, answer the uh, question correctly, you move on immediately to the next level, to the next uh, material. Peter uh, needs a little extra help, he didn't do that, that well, so he answered the question incorrectly, so he gets maybe uh, an extra reading or an extra video, and then he has to retake the question, and so on. Mm -hmm. Very basic, most, uh, most LMSs have that today. Mm -hmm. Now we get a little more complicated, so we call it by association, mm -hmm. and that's like, uh, you know, do you know the books like you choose your own adventure books? Mm -hmm. So these are like pre-programmed path that somebody programmed ahead of time, and that sometimes there's like a choice that you as a learner make, like, is hey, I like want. Is it like a scenario-based simulation? So yeah, it's related to it. So pretty much there are it's pre-programmed a little bit, but at some time you know, what is the choice that you make? And, you know, do you make choice A or make choice B? And then it puts you on these different paths. So, mm -hmm. yeah, very good scenario-based uh, uh, um, situation there. Agency, that is pretty cool, which I really like. It empowers the learner. And that is, uh, you know, like, remember the, the books when we used to flip through the textbook and we saw maybe hey that's an interesting picture and i maybe want to read about this and mm -hmm. so on so it's like really your interests right mm -hmm. and in today's time you know you don't don't flip to a digital e-text you lose the search bar or something like that search uh, function and so on but pretty much uh some systems allow you to search like the whole content for the course and then go in and search and look it up and so on so it's really adjust to your interest which is, i think is pretty cool uh, and then, of course, uh, the, the, the that everybody tries to pro uh, promise you, the, the most complicated one is the secret algorithm that some of the vendors have. And pretty much what it is, it's uh, related to data, big data uh, of, of previous users that use the system. Mm -hmm. And so what happens, say you have thousands of people go through uh, the experience with you. People try to cluster and create profiles mm -hmm. that are then similar. And then, so let's say people, you go through the learning experience and they say, hey, firm face, you're similar to this kind of profile. So what this profile did or what worked for this profile might work for you as well. Mm -hmm. So they're trying to predict your behavior a little bit on predict, uh, make some recommendations mm -hmm. as well. So that's uh, the algorithm. So that's something that mm -hmm. the student experiences most of the time. Could you give us a little bit of an idea of what the faculty experience is like with these? 
Yeah, I uh, actually don't have uh, any slides for that, so I'm going to stop sharing this right now. So, uh, yeah, so a couple of things that you that need to be considered is, of course, um, students could be a different time in the learning process. Uh, you know, so some people may faster, some people are slower, some people need more materials, some people need less materials. So uh, the way we adjust for that we still have timelines and deadlines that we use for our model because mm -hmm. uh, we don't have completely self-paced courses or so on we just have still faculty managing that and so oh. we make sure that um, that is there but also what's very different is there's a lot of data available uh, you know exactly how, what students are doing uh, where how they are responding to questions because there are so many different check-ins in the system so mm -hmm. as a faculty member you can easily review dashboards or you can really really identify mm -hmm. the student who uh, the students uh, who's struggling mm -hmm. what are they struggling with mm -hmm. and then you can inter make an intervention directly I mean from instruction I mean, I teach as well, and I say, I mean, you have, say, you have several, like, hundred students in front of you, you know, you see just a wall of faces, you know, but you don't know who's actually the person that needs help. Mm -hmm. But with this system, you can actually collect the data and say, okay, this is a person that I need to talk to and provide help. Wow. And so on. Or I sent them some resources, right? So that's yeah. been very powerful. So I like that. So what are your next steps? Yeah, uh, actually, next steps. We just announced uh, something called the BioSpine, and I'm, I have a little image for that. So I hope that's okay with you. Sure. Yeah. yeah so so and this is I'm moving uh, moon in that. So this is this beautiful graphic that we have, and this is really something that the School of Life Sciences here at ASU spear, uh, spearheading. They're leading it. And it's an integrated uh, curriculum in biology. What this means is that we actually interlink uh, 15 courses with each other that, uh, you know, the course where immediately connects. So let's assume we come across a topic in Bio 340 here, general genetics. Mm -hmm. And there's a topic that connects to something with uh, we covered in Bio 281. Mm -hmm. Right. Say, let's assume I'm in the 340 and uh, I don't, you know, I need help. Uh, you know, the system automatically recognizes that and provides me that information from 280, 81. Mm -hmm. So uh, these 15 courses are interlinked depending on your, your, your major and so on, mm -hmm. which is amazing from my point of view, because not as just technological challenging, but also we have faculty talking to each other, they have faculty aligning their course objectives and mm -hmm. uh, also the materials that they cover. So it's just mm -hmm. a great undertaking. Uh, uh, we have 50, right now 50-ish faculty instructors involved in this initiative. So. Oh, I like that metaphor. It really suits the bio field, but what about, I think it could suit other fields too, just the whole alignment you know yeah i mean this is something i mean we are in generally supposed to do anyway right but okay. uh often what we find or uh, when we talk to our student that is sometimes a disconnected experience like some instructors might teach uh, like there's overlap of content right some instructors might teach something that somebody else has ta taught in a previous class mm -hmm. or there are even gaps like uh, yeah. uh one you know the assumption that this should be covered in the previous class but it was not so that's something that we really found when we talked to our students and so we are really trying to make the connections a little bit more tight yeah so I just want to make sure do you think you know as you said we should be doing this anyway in all disciplines do you think you will transfer that that metaphor to other courses that yeah Yes, certainly. So, uh, so we are in the process of de developing this biospine, and of course, we're going to go through with a very rigorous evaluation and so on. But uh, uh, preliminary results are pretty positive, as we saw with the Gen Ed courses. Um, yeah. So then, of course, it's natural to think about other fields, other majors uh, who might be suited for that. So okay. there are definitely uh, things that we have in our back of our minds. Yeah. Cool. 
Okay, I know we're wrapping up, so, but quickly, if someone resonates with what you said today, but they are not sure where to start, what would be one or two first that, that they could do to really incorporate adaptive and active learning in their course? Okay, so if you're thinking about doing adaptive learning, uh, I recommend two things. First of all, uh, you can build it or you can buy it, right? So mm -hmm. um, developing it and building it takes a lot of resources, a lot of time, so and, and a lot of expertise as well. So the advantages to it, you have more control, but it takes significant time to spin this up. You can buy it, uh, costs money, but then you can, uh, you know, sometimes you can configure it, sometimes not, but then the implementation costs are fairly low. So you can have quick buy it or development. The second one I think is the most important one is really you got to think about when and where to use it. So what's your strate strategy, right, from a big picture? You know, uh, mm -hmm. for us at ASU, it was scale, large enrollment classes. We want to improve in retention and student learning. Uh, you know, that might not be in an adaptive platform might not be the best solution for a small, so for smaller classroom and so on. Mm -hmm. So really think about it where this might be helpful uh, and it's not just an add-on. Just mm -hmm. don't say, oh, you know, this is supplemental material. Spend some time in the adaptive platform. We really made this a core component of the instructional experience. And uh, so it may it require some major redesign. So. Wow. Good. Good advice. So could you quickly share with our viewers, are there any resources that you'd recommend for them today? Yeah, there are several resources. Uh, I'm going to send them as well, and I hope you're going to post them as well. But I, yes, uh, I, I recommend uh, Educause has some great resources, like the seven things you should know about adaptivity. They really explain that nicely there. Also, Dale Johnson wrote a great, great article, Educause um, Review, Opening the Black Box of Adaptivity, where he explains these four different types of adaptivity that I explain, uh, briefly highlighted. Uh, I'm also going to share like a news article about this uh, bio spine, you know, what's so special about it. And then uh, I'm going to highlight uh, our, one of the podcasts that I recommend for instructional designers is Instruction by Design. Uh, mm -hmm. And I recently did an interview there about adaptive initiatives. So if you want to, I, I think the podcast is great in general, but then also uh, my episode about the adaptive. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Well, Dr. Van Luzen, thank you so much for taking the time to share with us today. Thank you. It's my pleasure. It's always good to see you and uh, learn from and with you. So. Yes. And to our viewers, I encourage you to check out the resources. I'll be checking them out myself and share this episode with others. And we look forward to seeing you in the next episode of this virtual summit. See you soon. Thank you.